We're going to uh, share with you today uh, using the words that uh, we find from Exodus in chapter 15 today. Exodus in chapter 15. And also we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Now, Bobby read in, in Exodus chapter 15 uh, the verses that we have there, but I want to focus in on just one verse. Just one verse. As a matter of fact, there's a, a word in that one verse that I want to focus in on uh, today as well. But let me share this with you. This is what it says in verse 11 of Exodus chapter 15. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Now, if you notice in your Bible, that's a capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. That means Yahweh. That is God in his trinity. That is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right? Who is like you is the question. Yahweh. All right? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders. And over in Isaiah chapter 9, and we find verse 6, there's an interesting uh, thought there as well, chapter 9 and verse 6 in the book of Isaiah, which says, For unto us a child is born, unto us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, I've wondered what I should title this particular um, sermon. Um, I'm going to share with you the wonder that is God. I thought about that as a title. Or this title, I have a dirty mouth. I have a dirty mouth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do bow before you today and we thank you for the... Uh, time that we can look at your word, and I pray the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. We know that you are the mighty Lord God of all. And Father, we just bow before you in reverence, in awe, adoring your majesty. Bless us now, God, as we look at you, to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I want to teach you a brand new word. It's a word that's in the Hebrew language. It's a word found in our texts that I shared with you this morning. It's a word that describes God, not just what God does, but rather who he is. I was reading in Jonathan Kahn's book, he's a uh, Jewish rabbi, I was reading in his book entitled The Book of Mysteries, and he shares this one particular Hebrew word that I want to talk about today. Now, I'm going to figure out that you probably know what word that is that I am talking about. It is a word that literally uh, is used to describe God in a very powerful way. Now, some of the songs that have written, been written about this word are things like this. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Another one, His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Or, the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all. We sang that just a moment ago. How about, isn't He wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Or, my God, how wonderful Thou art. Thy majesty so bright, I wonder as I wander out under the skies. A person by the name of Gypsy Smith said this, quote, I have never lost the wonder. Socrates, I'm sure you've all heard that name before, said this, Wisdom begins with wonder. 
<coughs> I happen to like that one. Wisdom begins with wonder. Or Thomas Carlyle, a modern-day preacher, I should say a years-ago preacher, he said, worship is transcendent wonder. Wor- worship is transcendent wonder. Well, now, according to the Young's Analytical Concordance, the word that I'm talking about here today has been used nine times in the Hebrew language, and it is always, always, always in reference to who God is. All right? The word that I'm telling you today is a simple word. Pele. Now, some of you think, he's a soccer player, isn't he? No, that's not what we're talking about. Pele, P-E-L-E-H. And Pele means wonder. Wonder. Something that is so amazing that you can't do anything but wonder about how magnificent it really is. And you know, when we stop and we think about our Messiah's birth here on this earth, we know the description of him coming to this earth was Pele. He is wonderful. Isaiah 9, 6 said that. We call him wonderful, counselor, all these different things that we find there. He is the Pele, the wonder. And there's no doubt about the fact that his impact upon the world literally defies natural explanation. Literally defies that natural explanation. Because after all of the ages that that we have since Jesus was born, he still causes people to stop and wonder at who he is. We wonder at the birth of Christ. Six times in the Old Testament, the birth of Jesus is foretold usually hundreds of years before it ever took place. It was told that in Isaiah that he was supposed to be born of a virgin. He was. It says here that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, according to Malachi. He was. It also says that he was going to be the true ancestor of King David. Both Matthew and Mark tell us that very same same thing. You know, whenever... I think it's interesting that whenever our earthly reality interacts with heavenly reality, we have some words that are always spoken. If an angel comes to give a message to somebody like Mary or to Abraham or to any any of the people in the Bible, the first thing that almost comes out of the angel's mouth is, fear not. Why? Because people were a little bit fearful of seeing an angel. And so the first words that come out of the mouth of the angel are what? Don't fear. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to share a message with you. But I don't know why we as human beings, whenever the, the, the heavenly reality strikes our earthly reality, we get a little fearful about really what in the world this is all about. But I want you to notice when Jesus came into this world, when he came into this world, he came as not a grand, majestic marshal that is going to come on a white horse and he's going to defeat everybody. He comes as what? A little baby. He comes as just a little baby. There's nothing to fear about a little baby. You can accept that and understand that plainly, but that's the way Jesus came. But can you imagine, if you, if you will for a minute, that this little baby was God in the flesh. He was the one who created all of the universe, the one who sat on the throne of glory. I don't know about you, But that is amazing. And it causes me to stop and wonder. Stop and consider Pele, that Hebrew word. God, this is God. 
He is the Pele. He is the wonderful one that we bow before and worship. Now Pele, that very simple word, also speaks of the wonder of what God did while he was here. Everything Jesus did on this earth really should stop and make us wonder a little bit about this God that we worship. Because the disciples were in awe in Matthew 8 there where God just spoke to the wind and to the waves and stilled them. You should just look at that and go, wow, wow. Or in Matthew 21, where the fig tree, because it was not producing any figs, he cursed it and it began to wither before their eyes. You should wonder at that. Matthew in chapter 1, you should wonder at when Jesus dealt with the demons, he literally told the demons what was going to happen to them, and off they went. They obeyed this Jesus. That should cause us to wonder. Matthew in chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 2, it's a wonder how paralyzed bodies could all of a sudden just spring to life. You know, we should be able to just look at that and go, awesome. That's awesome. I can't believe it sometimes. In Mark chapter 6, what would you think about if somebody came walking, you're out in the middle of the lake, and somebody starts walking to you on the water? And at night, they thought it was a ghost. And then Peter was told, come on out and join me. And he starts walking on the water. And what do you think the other disciples did? Wow. This is awesome, this great God that we worship. In Matthew in chapter 15, what a great wonder it was that he would heal the crippled, the lame, the mute, and he could do all of this because there was no limitations to who Jesus or what Jesus could do. Whatever, whatever words rolled out of his mouth literally, literally reordered all of reality. He made broken muscles, tongues, bones, winds, cloud, demons. All of those obeyed him. When we stop to ponder the works of God, the wonder of God, you know, it should cause us to fall on our knees to worship him. That's who we have before us today is the wonderful God that we call Jesus. Sad part about this whole thing is the vast majority, at least in this country, literally have no time for God. You know, I heard one man say that uh, the reason why we have no time for God, I thought this was interesting, The reason we have no time for God is because we're so full of ourselves. Our hearts are so filled with what we want that there's no room for God and His Spirit within our lives. I wonder what happens in a Christian's heart, and I've seen it happen, where to look at God and to think of Jesus... And to look at him just like he's just some ordinary guy with no reverence and awe and respect and and love. I, I just wonder. Have you ever thought that the reason why the world doesn't honor and respect our God is because we we as Christians have lost this wonder of who God is? Have we lost this the sense of awesomeness, the amazement of all that he has done and all that he is doing within our world today. We have, we've have gotten so close or so uh, uh, close to God that we've taken him for granted. It, it just, who's, who, just God, you know. How can I describe to you the wonders of God? How can I define to you the holiness of who God is? And how do we define how we are to think of him and how are we to approach him? And I've thought 
as I was putting this together, there's really only one way that I can probably describe. The best possible way is through a word picture. I don't have a picture that I'm going to show you up here. I want to develop a word picture in your mind. And in order to do that, I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles, if you've got them, to Isaiah chapter 6. And I want to read the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 6. And let's create in our minds this picture of who God is and how we are to respond to the wonder that is God. Isaiah in chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah saying this, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, Isaiah cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Wow, you know, when you stop and think about that, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, you see some interesting things taking place. Now, he says, I saw the Lord. Now, he didn't see him like out in the desert where he was a pillar of fire or a a pillar of cloud. He didn't, didn't say that. And we know that he didn't see the essence of who God is because of the fact that in the book of John, it says that God is a spirit. But I want you to notice here, there is a word that describes this person sitting on the throne. And that person is called Lord. It's a capital L with three small letters behind it, O-R-D. Now, I told you what capital, when they're all capitals, that means Yahweh, God, the Trinity. But Lord means Adonai. And I want you to understand that Adonai, when we speak of Adonai, we are speaking of Jesus in the Old Testament. All right? We're speaking of Jesus. When he says, I saw the Lord, what he saw was Jesus, the Lord God Almighty. He was seated on the throne. And I want you to notice the train of his robes filled the temple as his preeminence, his majesty, his glory fills the entire world. And that's where he's coming from. This is what he's trying to say to us. Now, if you can picture in your mind the high throne of God with Jesus sitting on it, and he's dressed completely, it has a long robe that that the train that follows him was so long and so magnificent that it filled the entire whole temple that was there in heaven. Now, something else is taking place here. The seraphim were hovering above the Lord. I want you to get this idea. Here's this throne, and then above this throne is these seraphim. Now, a seraph is an angel. A seraph is an angel with six wings, all right? Six wings. There have been many different kinds of angels. The cherubim are different, but this is the seraphim. The seraphs are Angels with six wings. And I want you to notice, two of these wings were kept in reserve for any flight that God wanted these angels to do. If they, if they get told by God, I want you to go do this, or I want you to send, I'm, I'm sending you to this person to help them, that's what they used two of those wings for, for God's service. But they veiled their face with two other wings because they were not even able to look upon the holiness of God. They didn't want to pry into his secret counsel or overhear what God was planning or doing. They didn't want any of that. They literally had to hide their face. Two, they covered their feet. With two, they covered their feet, which is just a token of reverence. And you know what they were singing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. These were created beings, my friend. And how do they respond to this God? By singing out, holy, holy, 
holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now I want you to notice, I liked what R.C. Sproul said in this, in this vein. He said, God is not just holy. He is not just holy, holy. God is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, love, love. The Bible never says God is mercy, mercy, mercy. Doesn't say he's wrath, wrath, wrath. Doesn't say he's justice, justice, justice. But it does say that he is thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now I want you to notice verse 4 of what I asked you to take a look at in our text way back there in Exodus. I should say in Isaiah. Verse 4 tells us that at the very sound of their voices, singing holy, holy, holy to the Lord. It says here that the doorposts and the thresholds shook. They shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. What an awesome experience that must have been for Isaiah to see that. And you know, when I stop, of, stop and think about some of the reasons why people have quit church, why they no longer come to church, one of those reasons is that they're just bored. They're bored with church. And I have to honestly say, it is true that sometimes worship is not a thrilling and moving experience in many of our churches today. But I want you to, I want you to know what happens in this portion. This portion of Scripture. That the doorposts, these inanimate thresholds, this wood, this metal, it can neither speak, it can neither hear, or have any life in them whatsoever. They're moved by the presence of God. Just the presence of God shakes the foundation of the temple. The words we have here in our text is that it was shaken. It began to quake where they stood. But even more astonishing than that, there was one that was shaken even more than the doorposts and the threshold when he stood in the presence of God. Isaiah, when he came into the presence of the living God, God who reigns above all, the ruler of the universe in his holiness, Isaiah cried out and fell on his face and said, Woe is me, I am undone, I am ruined. You know, the word ruin tells us of a man who literally began to come apart at the seams. One man put it this way, he began to disintegrate. Now to integrate means that you bring things together. To disintegrate means you're coming apart. You're coming apart. Not physically, of course, but he was seeing something about himself, his inner self, where he literally just started to fall apart. That's what the presence of God should do for each and every one of us. There are too many of us in this world, even as Christians, who think we've got it all together. Isaiah was a man, according to the history texts, he was considered to be probably the most righteous man of the nation. He was a paragon of virtue. But when he caught one glimpse of God and who he was, all his self-esteem completely disintegrated. When he was standing there before the holy presence of God, and he realized what he was in himself, he saw the absolute standard of what 
holiness is really all about. He fell to his feet and cried, Woe is me. I am ruined. You know, the problem with you and I today is we try to compare ourselves among ourselves. You know, I'm really not as bad as that guy over there. And I know for a fact that we, we can have a pretty lofty opinion of our own character, but when we start measuring ourselves by the ultimate standard who Jesus is, we're going we're gonna to come apart. And our own sense of who we are and how good we are literally will be crushed. You know, when Isaiah saw that the only thing that he could think of was that I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips because mine eyes have seen the Lord Almighty, what did he mean by unclean lips? Interestingly enough, one man put it this way. He's talking about a dirty mouth. A dirty mouth. Why do you think he was saying that? Well, the Bible tells us that the tongue is a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. All of us are in the same dilemma because what the mouth speaks usually comes from where? The heart. The heart. What are our hearts really like? I think Isaiah, for the first time in his life, when he saw the Lord God Almighty, when he looked at Jesus, all he could do was grovel on the floor and say, what a wretched man I am. I know I'm getting pretty close to quitting, but I can't stop right here because we got to go a little further and see the gospel of Jesus Christ in this text. The gospel is very plain in this text. It lays it out very, very plainly for us. One of the seraphim was told by God to take a live coal taken from the altar of God, and he went down and he touched Isaiah's mouth, his dirty mouth. And he said this, This has touched your lip. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Who can do that but Jesus Christ? Who can do that? They did it. The seraphim took that coal at the behest of Jesus there on the altar. I like what Sproul says. He said, It is only Jesus who can release us from our guilt and forgive our sins. The holy God is also a God of grace. He refused to allow his servant Isaiah to continue to grovel on his belly without comfort. He took immediate steps to cleanse the man and restore his soul. Divine act of cleansing purified more than his lips. He was cleansed throughout, forgiven to the core, but not with the, without the awful pain of repentance. And yes, God does want us to repent. God does want us to repent. And if we are willing to do as the Isaiah did, fall on his face, understand where he was coming from, realize who God is, Then immediately, what does God do? He says, now this is the first time that Isaiah has heard the voice of the Lord. And the Lord said, who will go for me? Who will I send? And you know, that's one of the great things about God. He never leaves us without something to do. You know? He tells us, I am willing to forgive you. I'm willing to do all this for you. Now, I want you to go, and I want you to share this wonderful news with as many people as you possibly can. And this is the gospel that we have here. Now, Jesus is that Pele, that wonder, the one who is the miracle, the one who always should cause us to wonder, wonder over his grace, wonder over his mercy, wonder over the fact that God even loves you, and to wonder over the fact that you are saved. Can you know that you're saved? The Bible says so. Yes, you can. 
Oh, I pray that you would never stop knowing Jesus as the wonder of your life. Never stop wondering over the wonder of being saved. Never stop wondering over the wonder of being forgiven. The wonder of knowing His love. Just simply the wonder that is Jesus. Jesus is Pele. He is wonderful. Friend, I want to close with this. And it's just a question to you. How do you see Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Because He is the wonder. And you and I should, like Isaiah, fall on our face before Him. Because He is awesome. He is majestic. He is the glory. How do you see Jesus today? Father, I thank You that You have given us Your Son, Jesus Christ. And that He has been willing to live, suffer, die, and rise again from the dead. And Lord, we just stand in awe. We are just standing in wonder at Your great love for us that was shown to us in Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus and really have that wonderful relationship with Him, oh God, I pray that You would convict them today and that they would simply pray, Lord Jesus, I want to be Yours. Forgive my sins, cleanse me, make me Your child. Father, I just pray that that would take place even this morning. So bless us now, Lord, as we take the wonder that is Jesus with us home today. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.